Hello, and welcome to VOW, Voices of Wisdom, the show that might not be for everybody, but everybody needs to watch this show. Basically, my show is about relationships. And today, we're going to talk about relationships with the power of words. And today, the topic is poetic truth. And my guest today is Deborah Lassassier, and she's going to uniquely introduce herself. Those of you who don't know me or my style of poetry, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Deborah Lassassier. I'm a wife, a mother, and grandmother, a published author, and a distinguished poet. And I'm also a black female living in a country that was never meant for me. A black female living in a society where my skin color is still looked upon as a badge of dishonor. It does not matter that my great-great-grandfather was white, blonde hair and blue eyes, and it does not matter that I was born here in America. I speak, read, and write English. Still myself, like so many of you, is what this society refers to, hyphenated American. Now, the only problem I have with being a hyphenated American is that there's no such thing. You're either an American or you're not. The glass is either half empty or it's half full. It's your perception. I don't applaud or decry racism, but I will tell it like it is. And if you promise to keep an open mind, I promise to keep it real. Therefore, if my sarcasm towards racism, if my mockery, if my boldness, if my matter of fact offends anyone in any way, it's not my intentions, it's my reality. It's 2012, her name is still racism a.k.a. diversity. At best, I make a rhyme. I love it. Thank you. And the other poem I want you to do right now is I Pledge Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. My perception of reality may be a little different than yours. I had three strikes against me the day I was born. You know, this society is so hung up on color. It makes it hard for a sister or a brother. My skin may be as black as can be, but does that diminish who I am or deplete my hopes and dreams? Dark skinned people need not apply. When I go for a job and you interview me, it doesn't matter what I scored on my SAT or the fact that I went to college and earned my degree. You'll always judge me by the color of my skin and think less of me than I really am. Dark skinned people need not apply. Racial discrimination have opened my eyes. The deep root of intolerance simply means that racism is still alive. What happens in this country behind the handshake and the smile? Diversity in this country, again, is just keeping racism alive. A colorless world would be utopia. Equal rights for all, fair housing, equal opportunities, and justice for all. This society is dominated by men, which means power, greed, and that almighty dollar, which simply means there's no balance of power for minorities. I pledge allegiance to myself until racism no longer exists. I pledge allegiance. That's awesome. That's Thank awesome. You. Deborah, it's gl glad to have you on my show today. Thank you for inviting I'm me. I'm enjoying your poetry. Um, tell us where you're from originally. Originally, I'm from High Point, North Carolina. Um, we moved here to New York uh, in the early 60s, uh -huh. in the early 60s. You know, um, I, I want to propose this question to you. Obviously, um, I'm not going to share our age, but I, I, I pose this question. Um, obviously, you might have experienced racism, and so have I. So do you think that because we've ex you know, been exposed to racism and been affected by it, that um, we are more sensitive to it than maybe some of the, our younger generation who've never experienced it? Definitely, yes. Um, 
as a, I was born in Highport, North Carolina, we lived on the north side of town. Mm -hmm. Twice lived on the south side. My whole world was black. Mm. My whole world. I went to an all black school. The library I went to was black. The drugstores, churches, fish markets, everything was all black. Really? Movie theaters. And then when we moved up here in the 60s, my whole world shattered. All of a sudden, I was really a minority, mm -hmm. and I had never experienced that before. Never. I remember in conversation you mentioned to me as well that um, the movie theaters that you, you went to, that was in North Carolina? That was in North Carolina. That they were white we movie had theaters, and then there were black movie theaters? Everything was separate, but not equal. But you could go to the white, or you couldn't go to the no, white No, we movie? could go, but you had to go from through the in, from back entrance to rear, up the stairs to the no please section, and you could not make any noise. You know, it just amazes me when we share these stories with some people. They look at us like, you know, we're kind of strange or we're making it up. No makeup. But, you know, um, I also experienced, I guess we probably grew, grew up in the same era, perhaps. Um, and I challenge myself sometime about the effects it still has on us, you know, it makes us more sensitive and maybe more aware of the racism that's still here. And I mean, even when, you know, President Obama ran in 2008, um, they, you know, I felt the tension actually in my office. Do you think even now there's, there's still, you know, I mean, I mean, how they even talk about him as a president, you know? I know, I, I my husband watches the news every night. It makes me angry when I watch it. Mm. It really does. And to be honest with you, when President Obama was running for office, I was hoping that he would win, but something in the back of my mind said, Deb, this is still a racist society. Wow. I wow. honestly thought that. And I expressed it a few times to some friends. They said, no, don't say that. Don't mm. say that. He has a chance. Mm. But like I said, I was hoping, but I was a little skeptical about it. But you know, the, obviously then, there were besides the African-American people, obviously other people besides our race voted for him. So, you know, that's a, that's a positive. That is a that's positive. That's a positive. Because times have changed. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. But it's, it's interesting because I think we still see and feel, you know, unfortunately, the sting of racism. The stigma of it, yes. You know, and um, I guess it'll, it's not going to go away. Well, not in my lifetime. Mm. I don't think not in my lifetime. Mm. Give us another poem that you can relate to what we're talking about now. Okay, um, this is one um, called Beauty's Only Skin Deep. Mm -hmm. There's a little story behind it. I get mixed up if I want to watch you or watch the camera. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when I was about three or four years old, my mom took me to work with her. She did domestic work like many colored women did back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Her boss was Miss Fur. And I have to admit, like when I was writing this book, When Color Fades, and I thought about this incident, I never saw color with Miss Fur. Mm. Never saw color with her. Mm. Anyway, my mom took me to work with her. Miss Fur had some luncheon that my mom had to do. So this is in North Carolina? North Carolina. Okay. When I was about three or four. Okay. So do my, you mind saying the year? Or you rather Well, I'm not? 61 years old. Okay. Okay. So this was right. back in... 53, 54. Okay, I just want to give a perspective oh, of yeah. the time frame. Yes. Not trying to expose your age. Oh, no, I look good for my age. Because you still look good. I, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom took me to work with her. She set me up in Miss Bird's den mm -hmm. on the floor. So I had broken crayons and this old coloring book, paper dolls and um, dull scissors. Mm -hmm. So every once in a while, my mom would stick her head in the door. She'd say, Deborah Ann. And I'd say, yes, ma'am. She'd say, you okay? And I said, I'm all right, Mama. So she would go back to work. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of the luncheon, Miss Fur and her friend came into her office looking for something. And um, while they were over at her desk, Miss Fur was telling her friend about Lyra, that's my mom, mm -hmm. Lyra's children, how well behaved they were, how smart they were, how polite. And then her lady, uh, her friend just said, mm -hmm, as if colored kids couldn't, couldn't be all those things. Mm -hmm. So as Miss Fur was leaving the office, she looked at me. I had this huge smile on my face. And she looked at her friend and she said, isn't Deborah Ann pretty? And still smiling. And her friend looked at me and looked back at Miss Fur and said, she's pretty, but she's colored. Mm. Now, during that time, at that age, I really didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. But I remember my smile turned into a frown. Mm. And so when we got home, we stopped by my grandmother's house. 
and I went running up to her. I said, Grandma, am I pretty? And she said, yes, baby, you're pretty. And I said, yeah, but I'm colored. And she gave me a toothless grin. She didn't have any teeth, gave me a toothless grin. She said, yeah, baby, you're a pretty colored girl. Mm. And I said, all right, Grandma. So that was my inspiration to write Beauty's Only Skin Deep. Okay. Who sets the standards for what's pretty or not? Is a pretty face all society can see? Or is it what's inside that makes a person pretty? We tend to judge people by their personal appearance. Now, that doesn't say much about our society, now does it? How about the heavyset girl with the pretty face? Society rejects her, yeah, because she doesn't have a 24-inch waist. And how about that pretty Spanish girl, that pretty Puerto Rican girl, who has the long, wavy hair? She judged by her beauty or just her long, wavy hair. And how about that pretty Haitian girl, that pretty Jamaican girl? Are they judged by their beauty or rejected because of their speech and dialect? And how about that pretty Jewish girl with well, the tight, curly hair? So her nose is not like yours. Why worry? Who really cares? And what about that pretty girl, the one with the ebony skin? Society thinks she's not pretty because she doesn't have blonde hair and fair skin. But you know, I was talking to a pretty woman just the other day, but when she opened her mouth, her beauty escaped. What's the point of having a pretty face when you're missing character, morals, good judgment, and good taste? Beauty's only skin deep. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let me ask you, um, what inspired you to start writing poetry? And when did you start writing poetry? Well, I actually started writing so-called my first novel. I think it was back in the 80s, early part of the 80s. Mm -hmm. I was we were moving at the time, and I slipped and fell down the stairs. Mm -hmm. I hurt my ankle, so I was out of work and in bed for a while. So my husband decided to get me some books to read because I never had the chance to read mm -hmm. or told myself, I, I don't want to sit down and read a book. I don't have time. Mm -hmm. So he got me a book. My first book was Alice Walker. And if you know anything about Alice Walker, you know her writing. Mm -hmm. So I read her first book, and my husband went back and got me another Alice Walker book, read that third book. And then he brought me the last book. I don't remember the name of it. But I could not understand what Alice Walker was saying. Mm -hmm. So I read it again and still couldn't understand. So I asked my husband, could you read this? So he read the first couple of pages. I said, what is she talking about? And he said, babe, I don't know. So I said, you know what? If she can write a book, I can write a book. And he said, yeah, you can. So I started my first novel then. And you know, as a poet as well, um we're very, it seems like we're very similar. It's like you, you write poetry to express experiences you've had. Is that yes, true? I write everyday life situations. Mm. I remember once my girlfriend and I were talking on the way home, I was giving her a ride home, and we were talking about the situation that happened between her and her mom. And I dropped her off and I went home and I started writing. And a couple of days later I saw her and I said, oh, I, I wrote something new. And so I started reading and she put a hand over her mouth. She said, I will never talk about anything in front of you again. I had went home and wrote about the experience. <laughs> <laughs> but after a while she laughed about it because it wasn't that bad, but mm -hmm. it was true. So mm -hmm. I write about reality. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I want to name the title of this show Poetic Truth because it's truth. You know, it's a lot of things that, you know, you, you share and, you know, um, that needs to be talked about, needs to be put out there. And you know, we know even the power of words, putting words out there. Yes. You know, what do you feel about the power of words? In itself, it's power. Mm -hmm. I know that um, some people, like when they hear me recite poetry, they say, oh, oh you're too hard, you know, uh, you're too angry. Matter of fact, a guy from, I did uh, a class at Stony Brook University, and afterwards, he said, you sound so angry, your poetry is so angry. And I said, it's not that I'm angry, just that I live in a racist society. Mm -hmm. You know, and if that makes me angry, then yeah, mm -hmm. I'm angry. I think you have a poem, um, maybe this is not the time for it or not, maybe it is, about the conversation. Oh, yes, that's, uh, I consider that funny, but uh, my husband doesn't really. Anyway, this is a conversation between two women. <clears throat> la, 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 what are we going to do? I don't know what this world is coming to, babies having them now, babies. Lord, ain't that the truth? Just yesterday, I seen Tyrone, Tyrone and Tamika's little boy, out there selling drugs on the streets. The sad thing about it, he's only five, no more than six. Lord, you don't say. 
And just last week, this little 14-year-old broke into Miss Emma's house and stole her clothes. Lord, you don't say. And I read in the papers, this little seven-year-old boy shot his mama because she wouldn't let him go outdoors. Lord, you don't say. And how about them now boys taking them there, wearing them long black coats, taking them their guns to school, just shooting everybody up, just acting a plum fool. Lord, you don't say. But I say, who do we blame for the outcome of our kids? They only know what they believe to be real. Daddy's gone, taking care of somebody else's kids. And mama's working two full-time jobs just to make ends meet. And grandma, you seen the grandmas of today? The last we heard, grandma's dating some men, not quite 21. So who do we blame? Who's really at fault? Lord, Lord, Lord. What are we going to do? The conversation. Wow, I like that. I like that. You know, that even with that, you know, is, is the power of words we were saying before and the conversation and having the dialogues about life, you mm -hmm. know, about situations. And, you know, we could use words as a positive and a negative. You know, there's, I remember, you know, um, what was that saying? Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never harm me. That's such a total lie. Oh, well, let, not to cut you off, but okay. I remember in North Carolina during the 50s, the early part of the 60s, you could get away with calling someone the N-word mm. or Negro. Mm -hmm. During that time, you could not call anybody black. Calling someone black was like talking about their mother. Mm. And whether you could fight or not, you had to defend your mother. Interesting. And then later, James Brown came out, said loud, I'm, I'm black, black and I'm, I'm proud. proud. It played on the radio station like a national anthem. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it's okay to be black. Mm. Don't call me anything but black, mm. you know? You know, it's interesting how, you know, going to the root of, you know, thinking about how or why even race and racism, rather, racism even came about. You know, I think about that sometime and I just wonder, why they even have to be, you know? I, I guess sometimes, you know, I, it's really stupid to even, even have that question, but I have that question. <laughs> when I think about what it has done to people, done to a whole race, destroy the people's mentality. You know, they say that happened a long time ago, but people don't understand. You know, we talk about the Willie Lynch. Um, oh, I have a poem about him, too. Oh, you do? <laughs> okay. We might want you to do that right after this. But even with that, um, People say, oh, was, won't you forget about that's been a time. But, you know, people don't understand there was a power that happened, unfortunately, with words. Mm -hmm. And not only with words, with actions. And it's still, you know, after all these years, it still affects, you know. We still have that, you know, we've come a long way, and I have to say we have. We still have a long way to but go. But we still have it here. You know, for somebody to say that, you know, one day race will never, never be, I mean, it would be wonderful if it wouldn't be, but, you know, and I think it's a wonderful thing that we have a black president. I remember people saying they never would have ever thought in a million years that we would have a black president. Yes, and maybe that's why he's getting so much heat now, because they didn't think we would ever have a black right, president. Right, right, right. And, you know, the disrespect that they give him is, um, is very sad. It is. It's very sad. It it's very sad. But, you know, I'm learning that we have to still stay above above that because it's not all people, you know, it's just a, a certain group of people because obviously like we said earlier, had not some white people voted for him, right, right. he had to have gotten in not just from a black vote and okay. that was another thing during that time, um, you know, it was they were saying, well you, you, just because he's black that's why you're going to vote for him, you know, <laughs> his education, his everything about him. I mean if you him, took his, the color of his skin out of the equation and his credentials and background. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you want to do the Willie Lynch one oh, for yeah. us? <laughs> okay, where is Willie Lynch? I did a presentation at one of the high schools once, and I asked if anyone knew who Willie Lynch was. Right. No one had a clue. Mm. No one had a clue. Mm. You know, I did, as you're looking, I, I actually um, was asked to come to a, a Sunday school class in, um, I think it was in East Quag, and talk to, and it was an all-white church and all-white mm -hmm. students, but they asked me to come, it was during Black History Month, to come to talk about different things, and I, you know, talked about the power of words, what we're talking about now, and how, you know, you can make, one person can make a difference. And I brought up 
the issue about Willie Lynch. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know, most of them didn't know. But it was so interesting how open the young people was and the adults was there. I thought they were gonna have a cow. <laughs> They was, I could see on their faces, you know, they had no idea what I was going to talk about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just even that alone, the difference between the kids, young people being very open to it, and some of them in that generation, the older generation, having little, you know, issues with me even talking about Willie Lynch. So on that note, I'll let you uh, give us that okay. poem. Mr. Willie Lynch. <clears throat> I'm going to have to read that because I didn't uh, memorize it. Mm -hmm. I was watching the movie Animal the other night, and the name Willie Lynch was mentioned more than twice. Now, for those of you who may not know him, he was a slave owner living over in the West Indies. Mr. Willie Lynch was invited to Virginia to help the slave owners control their slaves. On the bank, on the James River Bank, this is what Mr. Willie Lynch had to say that day. Listen, my brothers, to what I have to say, and if you do as I say, your slaves won't be running away. You are losing valuable stock, stock hanging them. If you kill them all, who gonna work your land? You know what the problem is and you know what you have to do, my friend. I have the perfect method of solving your problem. I have a foolproof method of controlling your property. I guarantee control over the next 400 years. My method is so simple, you have to be heartless and cold. It will work best if you don't have a religious soul. You take their differences and you make them bigger. Then you instill fear, distrust, and envy in those people. Then use age, sex, color as a mental whip. That's what Mr. Willie Lynch had to say that day. Now, if we listen to everything you just broke down. You can read it. It's still going on right today. You know, and, and it's hard. People don't like to talk about this. But I feel like we need to talk about it. It needs to get out there. It needs to be talked about. And it's not like we're hating people yeah. and whatever, but I think it's a healing that still needs to be done. You know, and I think it's an individual thing, but I think it's also, uh, a, you know, a community thing. It's also a, a race thing, you know. But I do say on the positive note, you know, we have come a long way. And, you know, there are some good things that's come out of this. Oh, yes. You know, and I'm hoping in, on the positive note that we continue on that. Um, what do you feel about what's going on now again? Do you feel like it's going to have that same kind of feel now that we have in the re-election as we did in 2008? There, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to lie about it. Okay. Yes. And there are going to be a lot of uh, haters about it, but President Obama is the best choice for this. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand, like they blame, well, he didn't get this done, he didn't get that. He walked into chaos. Mm -hmm. He walked into a mess. Mm -hmm. And they expect him to get rid of it just like that. Mm -hmm. And then not only is he trying, but he's trying with his hands tied behind his back. Mm -hmm. And I really hope people see this. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's... You know, I, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say this because we're going to flow. Okay. Um, I was recently at an art show, an awesome art show. And there was a, art, a piece of art, and it was so unique. It was actually one of his speeches. And the artist actually drew the face of the President Obama mm -hmm. from his speech. And me and a friend of mine who was at this art show, we was admiring the painting. And this Caucasian woman came up, and the um, gentleman, the uh, gallery owner who was selling the painting, we were standing looking at it, and this woman was behind us. Uh -huh. And he went over to her, thinking that she was going to be acknowledging the picture as well. And she said so loud and so bold, I hate him. And I stood there, me and my friend stood there, and we, we felt this. You could feel the hatred. You felt it's like it came all the way she said it. And it was almost like even if she felt it, we had a conversation about it, even if she felt that she didn't like him, it's okay. Right. But for her to come out and say it that harshly, I don't know, you know, it, it's, it's really discouraged. It's kind of sad in a sense. But like I said, again, we have to come above that. It's not everybody, you right, know, feel right. that way, you know. But that experience, you know, having those experiences um, is challenging sometimes. Yes, very. We, we have like almost three minutes left. I want no. you to flow with a, a couple of other poems of your choice, maybe one or two poems, maybe one more poem of your choice. Okay, let's see. Um something oh take it with a grain of salt okay oh no 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 I'm gonna do lazy black brother okay when you turn the TV set chances are you'll see 
criminal acts of the African American. You can read in the papers on any given day awful things a lazy black brother has done. But just to even up the score, here are some things the lazy black brother has done. The inventions he made to improve your culture, all invented by the lazy black brother. The folding chair, blood plasma, bottle caps, refrigerator, and the signal for trains, all invented by the lazy black man. Home heat, electro lamp, hand stamp, clothes dryer, peanut butter, all invented by the lazy black brother. The mop, comb and brush, the light bulb, open heart surgery, all invented by the lazy black brother. Biscuit cutter, key ring, motor for cars, guitars, and all we get credit for is pimping and selling drugs. The typewriter, iron board, gas mask, lawnmower, all invented by the lazy black brother. Potato chips, printing press, fire escape ladder, baby buggy, all invented by the lazy black brother. Bathroom tissue holder, the electric railway medicine tray, and let the truth be told, the lazy black brother invented the remote control. I love lazy it. Lazy black brother. I love it. I love it. You know, we have like 50 seconds left, a minute left, but just quickly too, um, the media has a lot to do with how they present, you know, perception. You know, but um, the power of words, you know, and I think we can have the power to change things, you know, one person at a time, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I love your poetry. Thank you. And um, I think you're having um, a book that's coming out, or you have a book come, that's um, out? Okay, it's not out yet. I'm okay. having a book coming out. It's uh, Girlfriend, Your Scale Must Be Broken, and it's a must-buy book. It deals with uh, nutrition, how to eat healthy, mm. Um, weight issues, a uh, really good book. It's excellent, really good excellent, book. excellent. And the name of it one more time? Girlfriend, Your Scale Must Be Broken. Excellent, excellent. Deborah, this has been a great show. Glad to have you on. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Yeah. This has been Val, Voices of Wisdom. You have a wonderful day.